I'm Greg Strathy, one of the board members of the Minnesota Pilots. Um, Daryl, so for any of you around here, you probably needs no introduction. Daryl Bulldog is one of the most respected engine folks here in the Twin Cities and in the region. There's only one. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Oh, who is that? Who is that? Okay, well, I'll check that All right. I don't know if I need a microphone. Actually, kind of loud. It's, it's, it's flat. It's flat the whole bit. So. All right. Okay. All right. Uh, I've been fighting a cold all week, so uh, if I'm a little slow, uh, instead of 45-minute class, this might turn into an hour and a half. But uh, keep it way a little bit further. How's that? About right there. That good? Right there. Okay. Um, somebody came up with the idea when hell freezes over. Chances are somebody's going to get carburetor ice before hell freezes over. What we're going to try to do today is see if we can't get hell to freeze over before anybody gets carburetor ice. And um, we pick carburetor ice because we always have new people coming into the aviation industry every year there's an accident of some sort, or somebody loses power, somebody engines quit on short final, something like that, where um, an accident is involved, that icing is suspected. So we don't hear much about it anymore, but it's, uh, carburetor icing, as you know, has been around since the beginning of time, since hell started. And um, uh, so we thought we'd just revisit that a little bit because uh, carburetor heat is a good thing. Some people think it's a bad thing and not to use it as needed. But it's a good thing. It helps you out in many different ways. It helps you uh, clear your carburetor vice. If used properly, it will prevent you from even getting any ice. Number three, it will help you as far as gas economy. There is an individual that uh, found that out when his engine quit on short final and ran out of gas that he didn't even realize he was running low on. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Carb heat helps there. Carb heat will help you prevent exhaust valve and exhaust guide immature wear. It can help you so that you don't have to pull cylinders prematurely. The 0470 engine is perhaps the most common cylinder we get with worn exhaust valves and guides. And one of the main reasons is because people aren't using carb heat the way they should be using it. Uh, it helps, a little bit of carb heat helps your engine run smoother. And we'll see that shortly. And carb heat, done correctly, some people have asked me, you know, this Lena Peak thing, people are doing it with the fuel injected engines, can you do it on a carburation engine? Yes, you can. You can if you can. In certain conditions, carb heat will help you achieve that. So there's many reasons to use carb heat when you can, uh, because it's there to help you. Um, About 25 years ago, I didn't know too much about carb ice. You know, you hear certain things over the years and years. But about 25 years ago, I really got an education on it. Uh, there's an individual that taxied up to our hangar right here in the airport in a Cessna 180. It was about a 1973 Cessna 180. It was a beautiful 180. I, I never saw the individual before. And uh, he walked into the office and he says, I think I have some problems I want to talk to you about. And I says, all right. Um, I'll do my best. And he says, well, I purchased this airplane about a year ago. Uh, that was 25 years ago, a year ago that time. And he said, um, I bought it from an individual out in the northeast part of the country. And the engine only has about 250 hours on it since it was rebuilt by uh, a reputable overhaul station uh, out in the northeast part of the country. And he says, I just did the compression check on it, and all my cylinders are low. They're all in the 40s, low 50s, and they're all going by the exhaust valves and guides and leaking. 
And he said, not only that, but the colder it gets, my mag drops increases. I see 300 mag drops on my mags. And he says, what's going on here? And you know, again, I didn't know much about carburetor icing, carburetor heat at that time. And, and I said, you know, I really don't know. Maybe you better call the people that rebuilt your engine and see what they have to say. So he did. And, and uh, uh, they said, send the cylinders back, and we'll take a look at them and see what we can find out. So he took, all, he took the cylinders off himself, sent all six of them back to this company. And I don't know, it was a month or two later, they called up and said, okay, we're, we have your cylinders done. Send us a check for $3,000 and we'll send your cylinders back to you. And he says, well, what did you find? He says, well, the reason why you burnt your valves and guides up is because you were you, uh, taking off and landing on a dirt strip with a dirty air filter. And the guy says, I've never been on a dirt strip with my airplane, and my air filter is just fine. That couldn't be the case. And they kind of argued back and forth. And uh, they said, well, you're going to have to send us $3,000 to get your cylinders back. So he called me up. He said, what should I do? I said, well, you need your cylinders. You've got to have them back. You know, so, you know, you're, you're stuck. So he got the cylinders back, put them back on, and it was still cold at that time. And, and he says, Darrell, he says, I think I'm going to be burning this thing up again. Now, this, this Cessna 180 had three gauges in here that I, the common one was a single point EGT. Another one was a carburetor air temperature gauge. The other one was a digital fuel flow meter. Now, 25 years ago, I've seen digital fuel flow meters and fuel injection at airplanes. I had one, but this is the first time I saw one in a carbureted engine. And I, and I had asked him, I said, well, how are you running this thing? And he said, well, 24 square and rich in 75 degrees. And he says, you know what? He says, I can't be burning up these valve guides because my digital fuel flow gauge says I'm burning 17.6 gallons an hour. Now, how in the world can I be burning up my guides burning that much gas? And normally, it would be about 14 and a half gallons per hour, right in that area. And, and you know, I, I, I said, I don't know. I said, uh, he says, do you think there's something else wrong with the engine? Do you think the cam timing and something like this? And again, he's getting this high mag drop when it gets cold out. And I said, well, have you talked to anybody about this? He says, yes. He says, I called up Continental. They didn't know anything was going on. I called up Cessna. They didn't know anything was going on. Um, I called up, uh, you know, uh, anybody I could think of. And nobody's heard such a thing. And uh, he says, you know, I'm from Alaska. I've flown Cessna 180s all over the place up in Alaska, and I've never had issues like this. And I said, well, maybe there's something wrong with the engine. So he called up the company, did the engine, and he says, how about if you take the engine back and go through it and make sure the cam timing is right and all this kind of stuff, and so make sure the right cam gear. There's different cam gears could be put inside this thing. So, so he did. He sent the engine back there. They went through the whole thing. About two or three months later, called him back up and they said, okay, your engine's set to be shipped, send us $5,000. And, you know, it just about floored them. And um, uh, they said, what did you find wrong? He said, we didn't find nothing wrong. Your engine is just fine. He says, why am I having so much trouble? Well, you're flying off dirt strips like we told you and everything else. You know, and the guy says, that just isn't the case. So at any rate, he had to send the $5,000, got his engine back. Now this was in the winter time again. Now he puts the engine back in the airplane. Um, a little bit later, here he comes taxiing in. It was, I think, right around the end of December. And um, he taxis back up, comes inside, and he says, not a blankety blank thing has changed. I know I'm gonna wind up burning up this thing again. Something, we gotta do something to get this thing straightened out. Because I'm spending money here like crazy and I'm not getting anywhere. I said, all right, um, when all outs fails, what do we do? We go back to the instructions. You know. So I said, do you have your POH with you? And he says, yes. I says, well, let's take out your POH and see if they have a cold weather section in your POH. And sure enough, they did. <clears throat> Basically, this is it. Now, 
This is a cold weather section of a Cessna 182P. Uh, this is the one he has, but this is exactly the same as in his one, uh, 1973 180. With the 470 engines, they're all the same. All right, here's where the cold weather operation starts right down here. Let me get over here so I can read a little bit better. Um, during cold weather operations, no indication will be apparent on the oil temperature gauge, blah, blah, blah. And that you should let really, uh, they said, you know, two to five minutes at 1,000 RPM, run the engine several times at a higher RPM, and, and accelerate smoothly, you're ready to go. Well, I'll argue a little bit about that. But at any rate, down here, bring this up a little bit. Rough engine operation in cold weather can be attributed to a combination of, and this is key words here, of an inherently leaner mixture due to the dense air and poor vaporization and distribution of the fuel air mixture to the cylinders. Okay, what does that mean? You know, we read that and we said, now, what's going on here? For, we kept going, for the operation operable operation of engine cold weather, the appropriate use of carburetor heat is recommended. The following procedures are indicated as guidelines. Use carburetor heat during engine warm-up and ground check. Okay. Full carburetor heat may be required for temperatures below 12 degrees Celsius, whereas partial heat could be in temperatures between 12 and 4 degrees Celsius. The use of minimum carburetor heat required for smooth operation in takeoff, climb, and cruise. That's the first time I realized you could use min minimum carburetor heat, partial heat. Care should be exercised when using partial carburetor heat to avoid icing. Partial heat may cause the carburetor air temperature to rise in a range where icing is critical under certain atmospheric conditions. Next paragraph. If an airplane, if an airplane is equipped with a carburetor air temperature gauge, it can be used as a reference in maintaining carburetor air temperature at or slightly above the top of the yellow arc by application of carburetor heat. So we went over this. We talked about this. Uh, the airplane was sitting outside. Let's take it up and try it and see what happens. He says, all right. And the temperature was five degrees Fahrenheit outside. So uh, before we took off, we did our mag check. He had a cold carburetor. Yes? Did he have a temperature gauge? Yes, he had a carburetor air temperature gauge and a single point EGT and a digital fuel flow. The digital fuel flow was important here. Um, so, uh, like I was saying, his carburetor air temperature gauge indicated at the bottom of the yellow before we took off. We did the mag check and sure enough, he had about a 225 mag drop on both mags. It was a smooth drop, okay. We took off, climbed up to about 3,000 feet, set the, set the RPM and manifold pressure gauge to 2,400, 24 inches. And um, I said, all right, show me what you're doing here. So he uh, leaned to peak EGT and then enriching 75 degrees. And he says, see that digital flow gauge? 17.6 gallons an hour. He repeated himself. How can I be bro uh, screwing up my valves burning that much gas? I said, all right, let's go according to the POH now. So um, push the mixture back in. I said, all right, now put carb heat on so that the carburetor air temperature gauge comes up above the yellow arc, about five degrees. So he did. He was adding carb heat, adding carb heat. In the meantime, of course, the EGT was getting richer and richer, and it was falling off further and further, while the carburetor air temperature went higher and higher. He got to that point. I said, all right, now let's lean. So we started leaning. Before, we could only lean this far before we'd reach peak EGT. Now we're beyond that. We're way out. Further and further, the EGT went up to the same exact spot as before, enriching 75 degrees, same exact spot. And I said, now look at your fuel flow. What are you getting now? 14.5 gallons an hour. The fuel flow gauge was important here. And it's the first 
time I saw one on a float type carburetor where we could actually see what the carburetor was doing. You, you wouldn't know if you didn't have a fuel flow gauge. You'd be guessing at all this stuff. You couldn't see exactly what was taking place with this carburetor just because of a little bit of heat. The gas economy proved by th improved by three, three and one tenth gallons per hour. The engine was running great. You know what he said? He said, I've flown Cessna 180s and I never dreamed that. I'd never seen anybody pulling out this lever, pushing that lever in and doing all this stuff. He says, you know, and I says, well, it's running great. There's nothing wrong with this. And so he didn't say another word. Came back and landed and I says, before we shut it down now, you have your carburetor is operating at a decent temperature above the yellow arc. Let's do a mag check. So you have full rich, did it running up 1800 RPM. I said, okay, let's lean now. I'm gonna lean it out. And I kept on leaning it at 1800 RPMs until the engine was just ready to die, enriching just a little bit. Check your mags now, see what you got. 75 mag drop on both mags. Got rid of the 225. Tells you your mags are operating fine. Everything's operating fine. The engine is to be run exactly this, this way, right here. And we went, we went back into my office. We talked about this. He repeated himself again. I've never seen anything like this. This is just unbelievable. He says, I don't buy this stuff at all. And, and he gave me that look. I said, well, it's right here. And he gave me that look like somebody's looking at you that thinks you're stupid and, and like crazy. And he said, like, you're crazy, man. You don't need to do this. He got up from his chair, walked out, walked into his, jumped into his airplane, took off. I have never seen that person or heard of that person since. <laughs> he just wouldn't buy into it. <laughs> but <laughs> this procedure here, in my opinion, this is for mostly Cessna 180s and 182, the Franklin engine operates exactly the same way, whether it's a 160 horse, 150. 150 horse, uh, 180, 220 horse Franklin. It's built the same exact way, the same type of induction system, and it works the same way as this does. As far as I'm concerned, if you own a carbureted engine, you should have a carburetor air temperature gauge. Now, you can't use partial heat unless you have a carburetor air temperature gauge, because you have nothing to go gauge by. So you're left with either full on or full off. But if you use partial heat and you have the gauge and you keep your air temperature gauge about five degrees above uh, the yellow arc, about 40 <coughs> degrees, 39 degrees in that area, I don't know how you can possibly get carburetor ice. The temperature point on the carburetors, in front of the carburetor where the probe is, is located in the lowest temperature point on that carburetor. So therefore, if it's 40 degrees air going through, the carburetor is 40 degrees, how can you get ice? So if people have a carburetor temperature gauge and maintain your gauge above the yellow arc, I think hell is going to freeze over first. <laughs> you know, I just don't, I think it's impossible to get. So, yes? What if you have a digital gauge that doesn't have a yellow arc? Well, then you want to be about 40 degrees, 39 degrees, 40 degrees above. in that area. Above, just above. Going any richer, any higher with your carburetor temperature doesn't help you at all. It doesn't improve your combustion any better. Remember, they said over here, inherent leading conditions for distribution, atomization, vaporization. You need heat to get this. And what, what's happening is, and why the gas is being wasted, why you're going through so much, the carburetor is cold. It can't vaporize the gas correctly. It can't distribute it evenly. So what you get is big fuel droplets coming out of the discharge nozzle on the carburetor. It's not even getting burned. It's just going right through the cylinder because they're fuel droplets. It's not a vaporized mixture. So you're wasting all this fuel. Therefore, so. That's what you have to do. So why, why were his valves burning up? And why did these shops 
look at it and say you're flying off a dirt strip when he never... Well, I don't know why they were saying that stuff, but... Uh, uh, it worked once. <laughs> yeah. Um, they talk about an inherently leaner mixture. And when you get... The only thing I can say about that is these are... The carburetor isn't atomizing the fuel, so you get huge fuel droplets and it's going out. Now it's starving the rest of the cylinders for gas, okay? Now, he's operating in this cold air, operating at 24 squared on a warm day. Uh, what is 24 squared? 70% power in that area, 72% power, okay? On a cold day, zero degree day, what's your percent of power now? 75, 80% power, okay? Now, when you get up in that range, now your head temps start climbing. You're, you're operating leaner. Your EGT start climbing. And now you're running into a heat area where now you're burning up valve guides, especially when you take off under full power with a cold carburetor. Cylinders are going lean on you. It's a heat issue. Even though it's cold outside, it's a heat issue. The valves, that are, valves and guides that are used in an 0470 engine are the same exact valve and guide that's used in a Cessna 421 Gitzel geared engine that's turning 3,400 RPM, I don't know how many, how many inches of manifold pressure, but uh, they're the same valve. We don't have any trouble with a Gitzel engine burning up valve guides or valves. But we, that's, those engines are three and a, 375 horse, some of them are four and a quarter horse. Here's an 0470, 230 horse, having all kinds of problems with the same exact valve and guide. It's just that it's an inherently leaner mixture because it's not improper vaporization and distribution of the carburetor. Basically, what it comes down to. And it's the most common cylinder that we see coming in the shop with the worn valve guides is the 0470 series engines. It's tuned induction, right, right. It's not tuned induction, and then, you know, it isn't. And then if, if you aren't vaporizing the fuel-air mixture, the distribution is really uneven. Okay, your Lycoming drivers, you're a little bit better off. Now, on the 0470 series engines and the Franklins, the carburetor is bolted to your induction air tubes, okay? It's not bolted to the engine. So you have this cold air coming into your engine. The tubes are cold. The carburetor's not getting any heat from anything. On a Lycoming, it's bolted to your oil sump. The oil sump is warm. You're getting heat off of it. So it helps keep that carburetor warm. Now, I've known people with Lycoming engines that have had carburetorized problems. So I think Again, I'll repeat myself. I think if you own a carbureted engine, you should have a air, carburetor air temperature gauge. You can't use partial heat unless you do. I want to make that clear. You've got to go full heat or full off, one or the other. So you don't set yourself up not knowing where you're supposed to be and set yourself up for ideal icing conditions. <clears throat> okay. Okay. Um, there is an individual, I'll just tell you another quick story um, about this gas economy, how it helps your gas economy. An individual that I know, he, uh, he was on skis in the wintertime, he's going up to northern Minnesota for the weekend, coming back, okay? He filled his tanks up, he said, okay, uh, he was telling me this story. He was coming into landing at this airport and um, the engine quit on final. He didn't make it to the runway. He landed okay, but he was short. He ran out of gas. And he says, I think there's something wrong with the carburetor. I says, I had this planned and I, sh and I wasn't supposed to be out of gas. I was supposed to have at least uh, 45 minutes left. And I said, uh, did you use any carburetor heat? He says, no. He says, I've never used carburetor heat. I says, what's, what's the deal on that? just like what we mentioned, because of that digital fuel flow gauge and the other one, I said, well, you lost at least three gallons an hour on your trip, which 
pretty much makes what you lost uh, while you ran out of gas. So here's another important thing why you want to use carburetor heat on these things. If, he would have, if that engine would have quit about a two minutes sooner, there was nothing but houses on the south end of this airport. Imagine that, three hour flight, just made it by one minute to the airport, and ran out of gas because he wasn't using, he, did, he wasn't going according to the cold weather section of the airplane. So, just saving your gas now, three gallons an hour, you know, that's quite a bit of money. Um, it's kind of an interesting, uh, it's coincidence, I think it's just plain coincidence, but the standard day temperature is like 59 degrees, okay? On a standard day, a typical temperature drop between the outside air temperature and the lowest point in your carburetor is about 20 degrees. 20 degrees from 59 is 39. This is where you, we want you to be, 39 degrees. And I was thinking, boy, isn't that a coincidence? Was this thing planned out this way by these people that set up a standard day, 59 degrees day, where ideal temperature in your carburetor is 39 to, to get max power? And, and uh, I was talking to a professor, an airways professor, and I says, where did this 59 degree thing came from? Does anybody know? Where, does anybody have an idea where this standard day 59 degree temperature came from? Anyone? Well, I didn't know either. He said, well, as far as I can tell, he said France started it out. 365 days out of the year, they took average temperature, high and low, for the entire year, and it came out to be 59 degrees, and that's where it came from. I don't know if anybody else had any idea where it came from, and I don't know if that's a bunch of bull or not, but that's what he said. <laughs> um. <clears throat> okay. Um. I'll show you a, a, a graph of power curves. And sometimes seeing these things help people understand Question. Yeah. We have KPI monitors and other things. All of them have fuel flow. I'm not sure about the carburetor uh, sensor. I know a couple of them do, but that's good enough to do this? Yes. Yeah, the, the, the engine, engine multi-probe, engine monitors are great. We have learned a lot, going back to the digital fuel flow gauge, prior to this, you know, you'd never know it. I mean, by the time you tried to figure out uh, how much gas you're saving, putting on carb heat, uh, you know, you'd have to figure out, okay, how long does it take to get up, and, uh, how much gas, how much gas you're gonna use this, and cruise and how much gas you're going to lose here, you get involved with uh, uh, the exact science of approximations. But with the digital fuel flow gauge, uh, it just nailed it right down to exactly what the heck you're doing. Without it, we wouldn't know what we were doing. So we've come a long ways as far as gauges are concerned. This is a power curve for uh, IO 550, and I use this one simply because that's what I had for my own airplane. And the point about this power curve is it doesn't matter what, what engine you have. These power curves are all the same for an air-cooled engine. It doesn't matter if it's an A65, 65 horse Lycoming, a Gitzo and a 421, a Duke engine. It doesn't make any difference what engine you have, air-cooled engine. These curves are all the same. Okay, so we can treat this as any cylinder you have here. Even the round engines work on these curves too. Uh, you have cylinder head temp, you have EGT, you have horsepower, and then you have uh, uh, fuel efficiency. Okay, 
You know what ECHT is? This is real simple. You know what EGT is? Horsepower? Okay. Uh, Pacific fuel consumption is the amount of fuel it takes to, by weight, to produce one horsepower for one hour. Okay, you notice that's all on the lean side of peak. That's where your most efficient fuel spot is. On On, on, on these engines. So if <clears throat> when the EGT, when you're rich, of course, cylinder head temp goes directly proportional, straight up. Horsepower on the rich side of peak, the horsepower is pretty well flat all the way across until you get up uh, about 35 degrees rich of peak. By the way, 35 degrees, rich of peak, on your engine is the worst place to have it. You don't want to have your cylinders operating 35 degrees, rich side of peak, unless you're at a high altitude or a real low power setting. If you're up around 75% power, you're going to achieve your highest cylinder head temperature at 35 degrees, rich of peak. Okay? So you always want to be richer than that. So the carburetors and fuel injection systems at full takeoff power should be at least 150 degrees rich of peak at all times when you take off, when you're at 100% power or 90% power. Um, the fuel injected engines, you want to make sure your gauges are calibrated correctly, that they're set up correctly. Uh, fuel flow at red line for takeoff. RPM red line for takeoff, turbocharged system, turbocharger set up, red line for takeoff, okay? If you have all those parameters set, then your cylinders will stay cool. As long as your baffling's in good shape, you've got your cowl flaps open, and you aren't hogging on it, and you have a, a decent climb out, okay? You want maximum cooling for these engines. These are air cool. We're trying to get rid of the heat on the exhaust valves and guides. That's why we're dumping the gas into this thing that we are, okay? Because we're, we're trying to be in this area right here for takeoff. This area right here, the horsepower, you receive best power up around this area right here, okay? But that's where your head temp's the highest also. But for takeoff, you're going to be in this area right here. You notice when you get to peak EGT, your cylinder head temp is already starting to come down, and so is your horsepower starting to come down. When you get 50 degrees lean of peak EGT, now your, your horsepower has dropped way off, but your fuel, specific fuel consumption is at its best. Again, all the curves are the same for all these engines. Um, why, why should you avoid 35 degrees rich? What's the reason? Because that's what gives you your highest head temperature. Okay, now if you're only 60% power, 65% power, okay, you aren't going to achieve high head temperatures. So you can do it. If you're flying around at eight, 9,000 feet, you know, you can lean to whatever you want to lean to. This is basically when you're operating above 75% power, you want to avoid that. And if you don't have a multi-probe EGT gauge, how do you know where you're going to be at? Now, your cylinders on your EGT here, the cylinders, you've got a six cylinder, there's going, to, there's going to be dots all along here. On a carbureted engine, the induction system isn't the best. With a cold induction system, we'll get, get back to this valve thing, okay? If you aren't using carb heat, you got a cold induction system, these cylinders are all over the board here. If you ever went to uh, find peak EGT on a carburetor and it starts running rough before you can find peak EGT, you know, fairly common. It isn't that the engine's misfiring, it's that when you lean, you had a cylinder go way over to the lean side so that the power on that cylinder has dropped way off, and that's why it's running rough. It's not because of a misfire. It's running rough because one, one or two cylinders dropped over on the lean side. So uh, as long as you're on this side with all the cylinders, 
you have very, lo very little lost horsepower here. So the engine will continue to run smooth. It's when you jump over to the lean side of, of the EGT peak is when the horsepower drops off dramatically and that's when you run rough. That's why GAMI nozzles have done so well for selling on fuel injected engines. They put all the cylinders together, made sure the nozzles were such that they stayed together when you lean and they all went over together on the lean side of peak so that they all had the same power when they got over there. And I mentioned on a carbureted engine, can you do it? Yes, if you can get them all the cylinders lined up here together and bring them all over. Some induction systems are better than others. But if you have a cold carburetor, you're never going to be able to do it. Carburetor heat will help you get to that point. If you get up to 39 degrees in the carburetor temperature gauge, it will help there. I've had some people say they were able to do it. One person has a um, 0520 or 550, I can't remember, carbureted, 520 I think, you know, 182. And he says he can do it on certain days. He can go to the lean side of peak with his carbureted engine and fly. You know, if you can do it, you can do it. It, it all is geared on keeping your individual cylinders close to one another and bring them all over together into that 50 degrees lean side of peak side. You notice the head temperature, how far that dropped way down. That drops dramatically, along with your horsepower. That drops dramatically, but it's right in the best specific fuel consumption area. Any questions on that? That's about all I have. Um, I'll just open it up to general questions if you have any. Yes? I'm just curious, uh, I've got a way to it. Where, where can a guy buy and get a some way to put the carburetor heat on a calibrated way. My carburetor heat, I pull it out and I've been running the car heat for several years after the test. Mm -hmm. um, it works good, but it doesn't stay there. You know, the vibration of the engine, it moves in and it moves out. Could a guy put some sort of a burner uh, control or something on the car heat? Yes, you can. Anywhere a guy can pick one up you can, but most of the time I've seen it is because of, you know, there's that seal around it. The seal is worn, okay, and if the seal is worn so there's hardly any friction, that the ram air will move it. You know, you always have ram air there moving it. And, and would you bring up a good point too, some people have said they can't get the carburetor warm up even with full heat on in real cold days. Well then I said, look at your weather stripping around that little flap deal because chances are you got too much, it's not sealing right, and you got too much air, cold air still coming in. Okay. Yes? Is there a difference between 100 low lead and uh, auto gas and carburetor icing? No, I don't think there's any difference there. No, it's vaporization process, yeah. Yeah, same thing. Yes? You know, I guess everything goes out of calibration from one time or another. They're all mechanical gauges, but I, I, Larry? You can say the heat of water has a Yeah, you can have a thermometer gauge and you can stick it in there and see. Yeah, yeah. I guess you could do that. Like an oil temp, they do that with oil temp gauges. Same thing, yeah. It's just, it's not a real scientific thing. Yeah. Yes? Do you see any problems with trying to like only a 160 horse at around 300 for the cylinder head jump? At like 2400, it might keep the cylinder head jump down to 300. Do you see any problems with running that low? No. No, there's no problems running at that low at all. Uh, Pratt, and he, Pratt and Whitney had a book out, you know, in, back in the 50s, in which they did testing on their air cooled radial engines. 75 degrees takeoff power, and uh, they saw no no change at all. There, as a matter of fact, you bring up a point as far as warming up an engine. You don't warm it up according to your head temperature. You warm it up according to your oil temperature. Okay, 
So the head temperature many times in the winter time you'll take off and the head temperatures are still pretty cold and they function just fine. As, as uh, Continental said, <laughs> you know, as long as it takes full power you're ready to go. <laughs> but they didn't mention oil temp that well, but you should have at least 110 to 120 degree oil temperature before takeoff. And engine heaters help you achieve that so you don't have to spend a lot of time on the ground. But that's more of an indication as far as your cylinders, your overall condition of your engine than the head temperature. 300 degree head temperature is fine. It's a good solid one. And you'll have less thermal shock involved with 300 degree head temperatures than you will 400 degree head temperatures. Yes? So which temperature do you want to monitor to minimize shock cooling on descent? CHT? Yes, cylinder head temp, you're, because cylinder head temp is going to react faster than oil temp will. Okay, so if you're operating at 450 degree head temperature, let's just say that figure rather than 300, okay, and now it's a zero degree day out, okay, and now you chop the power at 450 degree day versus a 300 uh, 450 degree head, head temperature versus a 300 degree, which one are you going to shock the most? The big, one. the big one. The one that's the hottest. And also, the one that's the hottest at 450 degrees has lost over a third of its aluminum strength at that temperature. Where at, you're at 300 degrees, you may have lost maybe 5 or 10 percent of the strength of the aluminum. So which one is going to likely crack? the highest temperature one. So that's why you want to keep your head temperatures down as low as you can. It'll vaporize fine as long as the carburetor is warm. Use partial heat with a carburetor temperature gauge. Every engine, carbureted engine. You won't have any more problems. If everybody did that, I don't believe we would have any more accidents, no more engines quitting with carburetor ice. Any disagreements? <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, not disagreeing, but the, uh, the light bulb engines on a Piper, they don't recommend using carburetor heat on landing unless you need it or think you need it. So it's, it's really downplayed. <clears throat> Most of the time, these Pipers, especially the older Pipers, uh, you know, they, they have either on or off if you need it. Okay. They didn't have carburetor air temperature gauges, many of them, although some of the old radial engines did. But uh, I don't think uh, you'll find many of them in there. You know, some of these older airplanes, I have found carburetor air temperature gauges in the carburetor air box and not in the throat of the carburetor. And they, they're thinking that's, you know, the carburetor air temperature. It's not. That's out, outside air temperature. You need to be in the throat of the carburetor, the lowest point of the carburetor. And every carburetor design has a spot located there where you can put that little probe into. Whether it's a Stromberg carburetor for an A65, C90, uh, to a Marvel Chevrolet carburetor, to a Bosch carburetor, uh, they all have a specific spot for that. So uh, I would advise you to get one. I mean, it, it can't do you any harm, and as long as you as long as you have, uh, uh, keep it at 40 degrees, I just don't think there's any way you're going to get it. Do we have any time left? Are we maxed out here? 144. You got one minute left. <laughs> a little bit about oils. What's your best oil? What's my best oil? Well, I can only go by what I read from the, what the experts tell me. And the experts say that the Exxon Elite, the Aeroshell 15W50, and the Aeroshell 50W Plus are all about the same. Um, the Phillips Cross Country isn't as good as the other three, according to what I read. Um, however, the cam guard, the additive cam guard, you can, it's expensive, it's good stuff. Of all the additives out there, this is by far the best thing you could put in. Good anti-wear qualities, I can tell you a whole story about the person that developed it by the name of Ed Collins, 
who I've talked to on the phone several times. Uh, it seems to be the thing to do. If you take Phillips Cross Country Oil, which is a less expensive oil, and put in the cam guard, it will way surpass the Aeroshell, the Exxon Elite oils. So. Just uh, so you know, the last talk of the day in this tent is exactly on uh, lubricants. A guy that's worked in R and D and Shell oil for years. Oh, that's Ben Visser. Yeah. Ben Visser, I've talked to, I've known for years and years and years. He's very good. He was the Shell representative oh, for the last 25 years that I've known him, and uh, he's very sharp on this stuff. So. Okay, so come on back to the last talk. Get that question. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you.